Okay, hi everyone. I just wanted to give a quick intro today. Uh, Russ is in China, and we are very lucky to have two guest lecturers, Robin Dietz and Tuan Kulin. Uh, they're both PhD students in our lab. And I just want to give you a fun fact that I actually looked recently, and they each have over 700 citations, which is pretty good for a PhD student. Um, so we're very lucky to have them. They've both done right. a lot of work on I don't believe uh, that. humanoids, which they're going to talk about today. Um, and they've, they've also done sort of some more fundamental robotics work and work in other areas of robotics, but definitely a lot on humanoids. I think it's definitely accurate to say they're experts on humanoids, and we are lucky to have them talk to us today about humanoids. Okay. Thanks, Pete. Uh, hi, everybody. So as Pete said, I'm Robin Dietz. I'm a grad student, something like fifth or sixth year. It's been a while in Russ's lab. Uh, and so I mostly want to talk about uh, sort of how our lab approached humanoid robotics, especially in the context of this big event that we did called the DARPA Robotics Challenge, sort of what we've learned since then. Um, um, and more importantly for you guys, sort of how the things that we did connect to the ideas that you've learned in class so far. So things that you might find familiar, like LQR, model predictive control, trajectory optimization. Um, and uh, we're going to try to connect those to what's actually required to make an, a robot with something like 70 degrees of freedom work. Uh, so just to get a sense of what we did, this is the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Uh, we were piloting a relatively large 300-pound hydraulic humanoid robot uh, to do a bunch of sort of simulated disaster response tasks. Um, primarily, that involved getting the robot over to some sort of object and manipulating that object by turning a valve um, or plugging something in uh, or getting across some kind of rough terrain. Uh, that worked OK. I think we learned a lot. We, we were reasonably successful in actually making this giant robot work, which was something that we as a lab had never done before. Uh, it didn't entirely work. Uh, you might have, might have seen this video. Uh, I don't usually show this at conferences because it's it's a little overplayed and I'm embarrassed. But uh, we didn't collectively entirely solve the problem of humanoid robotics. And it's really hard to do a lecture on something that you've done research on because I, I sort of personally feel like everything I've done is probably wrong and not the right approach. Um, but I'm going to give you sort of the best effort, uh, what we think are reasonable ways of approaching these problems. Uh, I'm, and then we'll sort of end with how do we maybe not have the robots fall over all the time. Okay, so very specifically, uh, at the DRC, one of the primary things that we were doing was just trying to get a robot from point A to point B without falling over. Uh, we're not going to get into the manipulation side. You'll hear about that some next week. Uh, we're just going to talk about if the robot is here, we want it to be there, how do we get it from here to there without falling? Okay, so what are the, the characteristics of this problem? Sort of very complicated controls problem. Uh, well, it's high dimensional. Uh, in particular, the Atlas robot has uh, 73 states, whereas something like your Acrobat or your Cart Pole has four, so that's going to be a problem. Uh, it's highly nonlinear, so the dynamics of the robot change as the configuration changes. There's also nonlinear interactions between uh, the contact forces and the momentum of the robot. Uh, that's also going to be difficult, uh, and it's hybrid. So anytime the robot comes into contact with the world, its dynamics change. Uh, so that's going to pose a lot of challenges for the, the tools that we've learned about so far. So I mean, you guys have, have thought about things like approaches. You talked about LQR. Uh, we talked about sum of squares as a way to design controllers or prove that they're stable. Uh, we talked about trajectory optimization. So the question is, can we use these tools on this robot? Pause. Wait for someone to answer. <laughs> really? Like, what do you think? Like, for example, uh, what if we try, tried to stabilize that Atlas robot with LQR? Yeah? Are you sure moving it sufficiently slowly for some particular linearizable states it should work? Yeah. That, that's totally true, and people do this. Um, so, and the key is sufficiently slowly. So, yeah, LQR, right, linear quadratic regulator. The linear part means that your plant is assumed to be linear. The robot is not, but everything is linear if you look closely and don't move too much. So, we can linearize the robot around a configuration and try to stabilize it with LQR. We cannot, however, typically do that while walking. Uh, generally, while walking, the robot is moving fast enough that these local linearizations don't work well. Um, what about sum of squares? 
So you guys have tried sum of squares for like the acrobat and the cart pole, which have a dimension which is a lot less. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the issue is that sum of squares optimization involves relatively large uh, semi-definite programs. 73-dimensional uh, robot state put, put into a semi-definite program just really doesn't work. Um, that's not something we know how to do. Um, so maybe, maybe more promising though, trajectory optimization, right? So last week Russ talked about this contact implicit trajectory optimization and he showed Atlas climbing the, the salmon ladder and doing the monkey bars. So can we just run that? What do you think? I say you could run that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's exactly that's that's the right instinct. So yes, we can. Uh, and I think, as Russ has mentioned in the past, one of the issues with trajectory optimization on complicated nonlinear high-dimensional hybrid systems is that there's no guarantee that you're going to get an answer, um, and in particular, an answer fast enough. But what if you could, right? So if you imagine, what if you could just run trajectory optimization really, really fast? You could maybe run a trajectory optimization every millisecond, just wherever the robot is, plan a trajectory start executing, one millisecond later, plan a new trajectory, start executing, keep doing that over and over and over. That's actually exactly what model predictive control is. Uh, and for a robot like Atlas, it doesn't really work. Um, in particular, because uh, unless, at least for the computational tools that we have now, uh, we can't run a trajectory optimization for a robot that size in a millisecond. We can run it in maybe a minute. Uh, if your control frequency is one control action per minute, your robot's not going to work. Okay, so we need, to, we need to do something better. Uh, what we actually need to do is divide and conquer. We need to simplify the system down enough where we can actually understand it and do something reasonable. So we're going to divide it up in a particular way. We're going to talk about planning where to step. Then we're going to talk about a simple model for dynamics. And then we're going to actually execute that plan. And so I'm going to talk about the first part, and then Tuan is going to talk about uh, pieces two and three. Okay, so let's talk about planning footsteps. So I'm going to sort of pose that this is a useful problem to solve. This isn't the only way we can divide up the, the problem, the general problem of getting a robot from A to B, but I, I think it's sort of a useful sort of divide and conquer approach. Okay, so the goal is find footsteps. from A to B that the robot can follow. Okay, and I say can, uh, that's that's a sort of a loaded word, right? Can under some assumptions about what controller is running it, what kind of robot it is. We're gonna kind of sweep that under the rug a little bit. Uh, okay. But what do we what do we actually mean, what do we mean when I say the robot can follow this? So requires uh, consistency with the kinematics. Uh, and the dynamics of the robot. And that really just means the robot can't step farther than the length of its leg. It can't teleport from point A to point B. Like it is constrained by physics, uh, and also some sort of constraint by uh, the consistency with the terrain. The robot can't just go anywhere. Uh, it can't teleport through mountains. Uh, okay, so. What do, we, what do we have, what information do we have available to solve this problem? In general, in something like the DRC, and I think in a lot of humanoid robot situations, we're given the current state of the robot, which we have to estimate because we can't actually measure that in general. And we're given some model of the terrain. And that's usually sensed with something like a LiDAR. Uh, or a camera system. And so in, in particular, what that might look like, in this terrain map idea is we might have a map of the area in front of the robot and some sense of the elevation at each point. So our goal then is take this map of the robot, take the fact that we know the robot is here, we know the robot wants to get over here, and plan a set of steps that 
could safely bring the robot from A to B. Okay, this is still pretty underspecified. Uh, and in particular, this is really, still really difficult. And a lot of the difficulty comes down to this idea of consistency with the kinematics and the dynamics so that the robot will be able to follow these footsteps. I really haven't explained what that is because that's a really, really hard question to answer. Uh, and so because it's really hard to answer, we're not going to answer it. Uh, instead, we're going to approximate it. Sorry. Uh, and so in particular, we're going to take this sort of complicated idea of consistency. And we're going to approximate this as reachability. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. And we're going to take this complicated notion of a terrain, and we're going to approximate that with just good versus bad areas. So we're going to say there are some parts of the world where the robot can step, some parts where the robot can't step. OK, so what do I mean by reachability? So this, this idea of steps that the robot can follow, that's a complicated question. It involves the real dynamics of the robot. But it's not too hard to make sort of an inner approximation. And so what I mean is we can figure out that, for example, if the robot's left foot is here, there's some set of places where it can put its right foot. So maybe that set looks something like this. So maybe the right foot could be here. Maybe it could be here. Maybe it could be here at an angle. Maybe it could be here. Anywhere sort of in this set. Um, this isn't some set that somebody hands, us to, hands to us. There's a lot of sort of tuning and figuring this out. Uh, one way we can try to figure it out is through inverse kinematics. We can sort of sample, fix the left foot here, and just try to find a solution. Spend as much time as we want. Can the right foot go here? OK, yeah, that's good. All right, well, then that's in our set. Can the right foot be here? No. OK, that's not in our set. We can sort of get an idea of this. Um, ultimately, this is going to be an inner approximation. We have to be conservative, because this is all we know. We've taken the entire complicated kinematics and dynamics of the robot, and we boiled it down to something very simple. So we're going to lose some ability when we do this, which is unfortunate. OK, but even this simple system still hasn't solved the problem. All I've said is that there are some kind of restrictions on given where the left foot is, where can the right foot go? So. The question is, how do we actually turn this into a plan? Right? The goal was actually find a set of footstep locations. I'm telling you, we know that there's some relative constraint that if the left foot is here, the right foot can be somewhere in this set. That's still pretty underspecified. Uh, so, so how do we solve that? What can we do? There's not a right answer. There are several right answers. There's not a clear right answer. And there's some cool work to do if you figure this out. OK, so what tools do we have so far from this class for solving problems like this? What tools do you have so far at all? <laughs> I guess one proposal is you could, this one's a naive one, you could sample from that set of, uh, of like yeah. angles and these inverse kinematics to see if you could get a, um, a joint configuration. Yeah, yeah. Step in that way. Totally. And I guess you can use trajectory optimization to do that in a more intelligent way. Yeah, you totally can. Um, and so we, we, we do that. Um, so one of the ways that we generate the set is exactly what you're saying, sample configurations and, uh, and use inverse kinematics to sort of figure out if there's a way to get from A to B. And actually, the sampling thing that you mentioned, that's really important. So one way that people actually solve this problem is rather than thinking about this sort of complicated set, they boil it down to a very small, discrete set of actions. So this is, this, I'm going to call this idea one. This is the action set. Uh, and this is a very popular way to do footstep planning that uh, basically I think everyone outside of our group does, <laughs> frankly. OK, so uh, the idea is, all right, if the left foot is here, we're going to say that there is a small, finite set. So not this whole region, just a finite number of places where the right foot could be. It can be here, or it can be here, or maybe it can be here. That's it. In practice, you might use more than three, but like, actually not that many. Okay, so what is this bias? This idea of sort of a fixed, small action set turns what might be sort of a really complicated, continuous planning problem into something you can use search to solve. 
So specifically, what I mean is, if the robot starts here with the left foot, and it wants to end up over here, well, we know here's our fixed set of actions. What's the best action to take to get towards this goal? Maybe it's this one. So we'd say, all right, let's explore this. What if we put the right foot there? Now there's a fixed set of places the left foot could go. It could go here, or here, or maybe here. So what's the best one? Well, this one. And so now we have a new set of places the right foot can go. And so we pick the best one. And in general, this, we, we can't necessarily always pick the best one every time. This is sort of an arbitrary uh, tree search problem. Right? You might have to explore down one of these branches, backtrack, and find a better answer. Uh, but this, this totally works. You really can get plans that bring you to the goal in a reasonable number of steps. What's the problem with this? Yeah. So the robot's moving fast. Mm -hmm. and it sets up possible steps for all the time they're of it. True. Yep. Um, many, many that that is an excellent yes. That is an excellent point. Yeah. Yep. Um, even more so. What what if we could adjust the set of samples based on uh, the velocity of the robot? Are there still issues you can see with this? Yeah. Sometimes you'll miss a valid path. Not yeah, and in, in particular, this comes up. Um, the, sort of the reason we kind of rejected this approach for something like the DARPA Robotics Challenge is that one of the situations we wanted to handle was stepping stones. So relatively small places where the robot can put its feet. And so the issue is exactly as you say, what if the thing you want isn't in that set? So if the left foot is here, and your action set is these three poses, None of them is in the stepping stone. You just your host. That's that's the end. This approach doesn't work. So people have modifications of this approach where oh well okay if, if none of the actions are good we fudge them a little bit do some sort of local optimization. But I think there's sort of a fundamental trade off that like the more you the more actions you add the harder the search gets. But the fewer actions you add the more likely you are to miss important plans and in particular be completely unable to get the robot from point A to point B. Okay, so the next idea is that, that that's idea one the action set. It's okay. It's fine. People do this. It's pretty successful. Oh, actually, I'll use that board. Yeah. So many boards. Okay. So idea two is optimization. So in particular, we're going to just treat this all as sort of a big trajectory planning problem. So in general, we're doing an optimization. We have to talk about what are we trying to minimize and what are the decision variables. So we're going to minimize over the positions of each of the footsteps, which I'm just going to call x1 through xn. And we'll minimize some sort of reasonable cost function. Uh, I, I'm going to propose that a somewhat sensible choice. Oh, I'm really bad at drawing sigmas. Sorry. All right. A reasonable choice might be something like, how far is each footstep from the previous one? So that's xi minus xi minus 1. And also, we probably have some goals. So maybe we want to minimize the distance from the last footstep to the goal. That seems reasonable. Uh, but this is just the objective. Like, w there are a lot of things that constrain where these footsteps can be. Uh, so in general, we're going to say that, well, we subject to the deltas between footsteps, so xi minus xi minus 1, reachable. That's still pretty vague, but at least it sort of conveys the idea that somehow where you are and where you're about to be, there has to be a reachable transition between those. And then, so for all i, and also that the xi can't be inside any of the obstacles. Where we're going to define obstacles as regions of the terrain that are bad, things that we know we can't step on. If it's too steep, too, has big holes, can't support the robot's weight, something that hopefully our perception system has told us. Okay, so I mean, this is an optimization problem. We can sort of actually write this down in code. We can sort of note how close each uh, individual footstep is to an obstacle, how close each delta is to being reachable, and we can just throw this in a big optimization problem. I don't know, is that a good idea? I thought it was. Um, it didn't really work. 
Uh, so this is sort of the first thing I tried when I was uh, a first year grad student. Um, so I think it's not a terrible idea, I hope. Uh, but there, there are some really important issues, and I think the, the biggest one is, is avoiding obstacles. So the reachability is not too bad. Um, but this idea of avoiding obstacles lends itself to some particularly difficult kinds of optimizations. And I think it's sort of easy to get a sense of why that is. So if we have a map of the world, uh, and the rollout starts here and ends here, we have some obstacle in the way. In general, when we're doing an optimization of this form, we have to give it some kind of initial guess. What if we give it a bad initial guess that goes around the wrong way around the obstacle? Right? Even though the optimal thing to do is clearly to go this way. The issue is that for an optimization uh, solver to sort of move from the bad solution to the good solution, it has to go through this obstacle. Uh, you can think about this if you're familiar with homotopy classes. These are solutions in different homotopy classes. But it really, it's just if you imagine trying to sort of drag this solution to the correct one, you have to go through a wall. And that's just not going to happen. You're going to start violating this constraint. Uh, and so this is sort of a fundamental issue. And it's really because this is non-convex. So convex optimizations we can generally solve to global optimality pretty quickly. The idea of avoiding an obstacle it tends to be somewhat inherently non-convex. So what can we do instead? Well, instead, what if we embrace a little bit of discreteness? What if instead of saying avoid the obstacle, we say, let's take the world, and instead of thinking in terms of obstacles, let's think in terms of safe regions. So what if I say, this is a region, this is a region. So we have R1, R2, R3, R4. So I hope you'll agree that it's equivalent to saying you're outside the obstacle, or you're inside R1, or R2, or R3, or R4. So instead of saying this, we're going to say xi is in R1, or R2, or R3, or R4. OK, so we've, yeah. Wait, why does it make the problem more complex? Yeah, so it, I, in some sense it doesn't. It's still a hard problem. Um, but what we're doing is we're sort of embracing the non-convexity in a way that's going to let us apply tools that actually know how to solve this problem. And specifically, what this lets us do is this lets us write the problem down as a mixed integer convex optimization. So, and that's, that's the like fundamental idea. So a mixed integer optimization is an optimization that has some of its decision variables constrained to only take integer values. They're not continuous. They're somehow discrete. And in particular, there's sort of a discreteness here. We're going to say you're either in R1 or R2 or R3 or R4. And that's the discreteness. Um, it's hard to, to, to actually write these down. We tend to do it in, um, in a binary format. And specifically, what that looks like is we're going to make a matrix of variables, H, where each element of H is 0 or 1. And there are 4 by n of them. So 4 because there are 4 regions in this problem, n for the number of footsteps. And we're going to say that H, uh, J, I being 1, implies that footstep I is in region J. This doesn't tell you how to solve the problem, but at least it's sort of it's it's starting to hint at what we're going to do. This H is going to act as an indicator that decides for each footstep which region is it in. Okay, well, well, every footstep needs to be safe, so that means every footstep needs to be in some region, and we can express that with a simple linear constraint. Man, I'm bad at sigmas. A physics degree, and I can't do sigmas. Uh, so we're going to say that the sum of the H J I for J equals one to four equals 1, which is to say, for each footstep i, one of the hji's is 1. So that means every footstep has to be safe. This is just a linear constraint. That's easy. So this is convex. This is actually something we can write in a convex way, provided each of these regions it's, itself is convex. Yeah? Is the foot 
point? Yeah, so uh, I, yeah, I'm going to mostly ignore that. Yes, um, it's sufficient to think about it as a point because we can actually do what's called configuration space planning. So we can essentially inflate the obstacles by the shape of the foot and then treat the foot as a point. Um, yeah, I probably don't have time to get into that. But yes, it, we, we can in general do problems like this by making the obstacles bigger so that everything's easier to think about foot's, feet as points. Um, and in particular, that's actually going to either mean making the obstacle bigger or equivalently making all the regions smaller. Rotation makes that weird, but it's possible. Um, OK, so this is convex. This is convex. This is not. This is binary. But the really cool part is that we actually have tools. So there are commercial solvers and some open source solvers that can solve optimizations where we have an objective like this, some kind of quadratic objective. with these explicit binary constraints. Uh, and they can actually solve them to global optimality. So in the worst case, they do that by checking every possible assignment. But uh, in general, they are able to use good heuristics to solve them much quicker than that. And so we can end up planning footsteps from A to B, where we know that, for example, the foot's first footstep is in region 1, the second's in region 1, the third's in region 4, the fourth's in region, five, uh, region 3, and then we stay in region 3 until we get to the goal. And so we'll see that encoded in this H matrix that we had an explicit assignment to region 1, region 1, region 4, region 3, region 3, region 3. And the cool part is because we can write this down in a way that our solvers can provide globally optimal solutions, we don't have to worry about this issue of getting stuck on the wrong side of an obstacle. We can actually solve the problem to completion. The other nice advantage is this sort of idea of stepping stones that we were talking about before. That's not a problem at all. Right? Stepping stones are easy because if you just have a set of stepping stones, where you just label them region 1 and region 2, bam, you're done. It turns out actually stepping stones are the, the case in which this is by far the easiest. Uh, you might reasonably ask, how did I come up with these? And the answer is, that's hard. Uh, NP hard, even. Uh, so this is not like a perfect solution to the problem. And I think in particular, because it requires finding these nice regions, which, unless you've carefully selected an example for lecture where it's easy, is in general quite challenging. Um, and also, because you're casting this as a very general optimization problem, they can take a long time to solve. Um, certainly long enough that we can't use this to plan footsteps while the robot is falling over, we think. Uh, we've tried, and so far it hasn't worked. Uh, Greg and I still have some plans. But uh, we can solve it fast enough to sort of put a goal out in the world, ask the robot to get from A to B, and plan footsteps only using these safe regions. So does that make sense? Okay. So I haven't talked at all about dynamics. Just, just this sort of simple reachability notion, uh, or any, anything about the kinematics, anything about the timing, uh, anything about how to change this as the robot is disturbed, because those are hard and I don't know the answers. Um, but Tuan is going to talk about how we actually execute something like this. So given these footsteps, how do we use those to get the robot from A to B? Cool. OK, and then I'll come back at the end. Working? Close to It's good? It's good. Yeah? Okay. All right, so I'm Tuan. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, how you, well, like Robin said, how you take this this kind of footstep plan, which is only uh, in kinematic terms, and um, use it to control your whole robot. Um, so we're, we're sort of going to take an intermediate step because even if you know all of these uh, footsteps that you want to hit, and even if you, if you know the timing, suppose we also get the timing from some, some planner like this, uh, so the exact times at which we're going to be contacting the ground, um, then we've gotten rid of the sort of the hybrid part. Well, it, the dynamics are still uh, different. Uh, depending on whether you're in contact with the, uh, with the world at one location or at two locations, for example. But still, it, it's gotten much easier, but still not to the point that we can just use this kind of uh, online trajectory optimization, model predictive control, nonlinear model predictive control. Um, 
uh, like uh, straight away. So what we're going to do is, is sort of stay in, um, in this world where we think about simple models and abstractions of the dynamics that we can work with. Um, so you've already seen a couple of different uh, simple models of locomotion, I guess. Uh, you guys name one or two? Slip. Slip model, good. Uh, let me see. All right, so spring loaded inver inverted pendulum. Uh, what else? Uh, there's the, the rimless wheel, which is, I mean, it, it, it walks, sort of, I guess, for some defini well, definition of walking. And uh, I think you've also seen the, the compass gates model, right? And the river hopper. Okay, yeah, right. Um, all right, so we're actually not going to be using any of these models. Um, so the, the first one, I guess, the slip model is still nonlinear. Uh, also, it doesn't really capture, it, it kind of captures walking, but more running, maybe. Uh, the rimless wheel, well, there's not really any actuation going on there, so you'd need sort of a plane to go down. <laughs> Um, the compass gates, well, there's two flavors, I guess. There's the unactuated one where there's the same problem, but uh, the, the actuated one still has the problem that it's nonlinear, so it's still not trivial to work with. Uh, Raybert Hopper, well, you guys have, have come up with a heuristic control law for that, but uh, planning is also, again, not, not trivial. Um, so what we're actually looking for is a linear model so that we can really quickly and easily plan. Uh, and that model is going to be the linear inverted pendulum. Uh, let me see. PM, uh, linear inverted pendulum mode or model. In the original paper, it was mode, but usually people call, just call it model. Uh, so what's it all about? Uh, let's see. So there are a couple of different interpretations of this of this model. Uh, the first one is that it's just the linearization of an inverted pendulum. So we've all seen the, the pendulum. I think that was lecture one for you guys. So you just linearize it about the upright configuration and uh, do basically a change of coordinates. Uh, I'll show you exactly what I mean in a second. We're not gonna do the linearization here. You can do that at home. Uh, there's, there's two other interpretations. Uh, one is um, not really as, the, um, as an approximation of an already kind of simple model, but more as a simple model of its own uh, that has uh, certain constraints, I guess. Uh, so let's go through that one. Um, so suppose we have our robot as a point mass. That's sort of the simplest possible approximation of a robot, right? Uh, then let's also assume that there's some place on the ground where uh, forces are going to be exerted. Um, and in fact, there's going to be uh, some kind of exp extensible rod. So let me actually draw it like this. There's like this extensible actuated rod that goes to the ground. So there's a point here. Let's call this uh, X base. So we've got X and Z. Um, so there's this point mass has a mass M with gravity acting down on it, Mg. Uh, and then we're going to say this uh, this point mass is going to move on a plane only, only on a, a horizontal plane at some height uh, z naught. Um, 
Um, okay. So in order to keep the, uh, the point mass on this plane, what needs to happen? There needs to be a force balance in the z direction, right? It can't accelerate. So that means that the force exerted by this extensible rod has to be exactly mg in the other direction, right? Um, but this rod can only exert forces in, in the direction of the rod itself. So let me move this over here. So this was mg. So this is the, the force that this, this uh, uh, rod exerts on the point mass. So what uh, we already know the, the z component of it, fz. What is fx here? Well, we can basically just find that from, from a set of si similar triangles. Uh, so if you just go down here, uh, there's this triangle here, which is sort of in terms of the kinematics. And then there's this uh, triangle here in terms of the forces. Those triangles are similar. Uh, so that means that, uh, so let's see, we've called this x base, we call this x, position of the mass. Uh, so we say that fx divided by x minus x base is equal to, this is really bad, uh, fz divided by m times g. Right, so fx is, uh, what am I doing? Uh, fc, sorry, divided by z naught. This was m, j, m times g. So fx is uh, then gonna be mg divided by z naught times x minus x base. All right, so then according to Newton, the dynamics in the x direction are just gonna be mass times x double dot. Is this fx? Is mg over z naught times x minus x base. And we see that here the m's basically cancel. Right, so I can just get rid of these on both sides. And these are the dynamics of the linear inverted pendulum. Uh, so they're very simple. So it's, it's just a second order system. It's linear, of course, that's what we were looking for. Um, and uh, so we, we can sort of apply our standard tools for linear systems here. So just to uh, complete the picture, uh, in state space form, this would look like x, x dot. I'm not gonna have enough space, of course. Let's just do this. Uh, is that a good idea? Yeah, that's fine. So x, x dot equals uh, zero g over z naught, one, zero, x, uh, x, x dot. Right, so x dot is x dot, and x is g over z naught times x, plus uh, zero, I am messing this up. Sorry, plus zero minus g over z naught times x base. So we can treat this base position as an input, and then we just have A matrix here, B matrix here. Um, 
So this is just the standard form and it's a tiny system, right? Now this is only for 2D. Uh, you can really easily generalize this to 3D. Uh, basically the, the dynamics in the X direction are just completely decoupled from the Y, di y direction. If you make this assumption um, that the uh, uh, mass moves on a plane, uh, which is really nice. Um, so what kind of techniques can you apply then in order to um, uh, all right. let me let me get back to that point um, first uh, first let's actually look at the dynamics uh, to a face portrait of the dynamics uh, so this was a face portrait of the linear inverted pendulum and I just said basically that, that another interpretation of this LIPM is that we're going to um, linearize it about the upright configuration, right? So that's about this point. So in fact, if you zoom in, you get this. Uh, so there's one stable eigenvector and one unstable eigenvector. So the, the eigenvalues are plus or minus square roots g over z naught. Um, and so what happens if you uh, start on this stable eigenvector, for example, is uh, you have some amount of velocity that brings you just upright. And if you start over here on this side, then you're going to be moving towards your, your base, your pivot. So this is for, for a fixed, fixed base, basically. Uh, you're going to start moving in that direction, but then you're never quite going to make it, right? So, and you fall back. You fall back. Um, and then over here, you actually go so fast that you make it all the way over this base point. And, and so if, if your base points uh, were fixed, then that would mean that you can keep walking, basically. Because what can you do then uh, if you get to this, to, to some state over here where you've already passed your um, your base point? Is you can take a step by basically just resetting your base point, which makes means that you move horizontally in this phase plot over here, and then you can keep keep going again. So. Uh, the, the discrete events are basically just horizontal translations in this phase plot. And then uh, you have this curve that, that's sort of the continuous dynamics as, you, uh, as they evolve. Um, okay. So this is sort of a, seems like an arbitrary model still. Um, we just started with this idea of, of um, t taking something that kind of looks like a pendulum, but is that really motivated very well? Uh, so there's this third interpretation of the LIPM that sort of helps understand how the uh, elements of this simple model are connected to, to the full robot. Um, and for that, we sort of need this additional idea of a center of mass. Uh, I mean, most of you have heard of it, but uh, I, I'm still going to show you a little bit about how center of mass dynamics works in general. So let's just take, take a step back and consider uh, some mass here. Uh, let's just draw it like this. So this is M1. Uh, and here's another mass, M2. So this is very abstract. Uh, and suppose there are some external forces acting on both of these masses. So there's a F X, oops, one, F X two. Um, and then in addition, so these external forces could com come from, for example, contact with the world. Um, but then, in addition, there's, uh, there, there are these internal forces. Uh, so uh, maybe M1 is exerting some force on M2, F12, uh, and M2 is exerting a force F21 on, uh, on M1, or the other way around. Um, 
So why did I draw them like this? Well, Newton tells us that these forces need to be equal and opposite, right? So if we write down the dynamics of each of the, these masses, we get m1 times uh, x1 double dot. Uh, or I should say, let's just do a vector here, r1 double dot uh, equals fx1 plus f12 and m2 r2 double dot is fx2 plus f21. All right, so what happens if we sum these? Well, we know that F12 is minus, oops, minus F21. All right, so these, these will cancel. These internal forces will cancel. And only, the only thing that leave, that's uh, left over are the external forces. So we get M1, uh, R1, double dot, plus M2, R2, double dot is uh, some of the external forces. All right. So does anybody recognize what this is on the, on the left here? All right. Maybe if I divide both sides by M1 plus M2. Left hand side, anybody? So, this is just the, the center of mass acceleration, right? So, center of mass is sum over i, mi times ri, uh, divided by mi, uh, sorry, sum over i, mi. That's the center of mass. So the point of this whole thing is that you can generalize this to arbitrarily many uh, masses. Uh, you can also generalize it to uh, uh, angular, uh, an angular view of things, I guess. Well, let me skip that. Uh, but the, the, sort of the, the point is that the only thing that matters is the external forces for the acceleration of the center of mass. Right? All of these internal forces cancel. So it doesn't matter if, there's, if there were a spring in between here or some actuation or God knows what. It doesn't matter. Um, so if we go back to the inverted pendulum, um, sort of the, the third uh, interpretation is that this is just the center of mass of the robot. This doesn't matter. There, there can be any kind of actuated uh, um, uh, mechanism in between as long as it keeps you on this constant height. Uh, the force is going to be just the sum of the external forces, the sum of the, the ground contact forces, really. And, and gravity still makes sense if it's just applied to the center of mass. So now we sort of have the, the, the link between the full model and, uh, and the simple model. Uh, let me see. I skip anything. All right, and then, so now we have this, uh, um, this simple model, and we have the footsteps. And let's assume we also have the timing of the footsteps. Uh, what, what can we do in order to, to plan a trajectory for the center of mass of the whole robot? Well, we can just apply one of these standard techniques, like TVLQR, for example, right? Uh, I will not go into too much detail about how to do that exactly for this model. But you can see that it's sort of straightforward to do so. Um, yeah, you, you have these footstep locations. Uh, let me, oh, it's fine. This is a top down view. Uh, you have your initial center of mass position and velocity. You have some final center of mass position. And uh, you can just discretize in time. Uh, maybe for t equals 1 through uh, t equals 2 to 2, 
you have the constraints that this base position, which is now the center of pressure, actually, of the robot, needs to be inside of this uh, region, which, if it's described by a polyhedron, is just a linear constraint or a set of linear constraints. Then maybe for t equals 2 to... So three, you have the constraint that center of pressure needs to be inside of the convex hull of these two, because you're standing on both, or you have uh, both of these supports available to you. Um, and then for t equals three to t, t equals four, you have this one, uh, just this one again, and so on. Right, so you have these, the, the, the set of constraints that you have on the center of pressure are time varying. But that's fine. Uh, they are linear constraints. So we can uh, solve this using TVLQR. And we can even, uh, since both the dynamics and the constraints are linear, uh, it basically boils down to a quadratic program. And quadratic programs we can run online and run really quickly. Uh, so that also affords a little bit of robustness. So if we didn't know exactly in the beginning where the center of mass was or what its velocity was, then uh, probably when we try to execute the plan, um, we might not exactly get there, but that's okay. We'll just replan again the next uh, millisecond later. Uh, okay. So we've done all this planning now in terms of the simple model, this linear inverted pendulum. Uh, how do we control the full robot, uh, full robot using the results from this linear inverted pendulum? Uh, and so, yeah, basically the, the takeaway here is that the, you get the center of mass as a function of time out of this type of approach. Uh, all right, so now let's get back to a high dimensional robot. Uh, but before we uh, go to like an underactuated uh, uh, robot that has contact with the with the world, we're, we're first just gonna consider uh, a complicated robot arm, basically. Um, so suppose here we have the fixed world, and then there's a joint here, some link, joint, link, joint, link. Maybe there's even a tree structure. All right. So for this kind of robots, and it can be in 3D as well, you already know that the equations of motion take a, a specific form, right? You've seen this before. Uh, so there's this mass matrix, H of Q times Q double dot plus uh, I'm going to use notation that's a little bit different from what uh, Russ uses, but that's okay. Uh, C of Q and Q dot. And this is going to contain uh, the Coriolis forces as well as gravity this time. Um, equals tau. So we're going to just assume that we, can, we have actuators at all the joints. So what can we do if we want to control this robot? I know this is underactuated robotics, but you guys have seen, you, you guys know probably what to do in this case, because it's easier, right? Any ideas? Right, exactly. So we can, we can do feedback linearization. Oops. Essentially what it boils down to is just if we have some set of desired uh, joint accelerations that we want to achieve, then we just plug that in here basically. Say these are our desired joint accelerations, ta-da, here are the torques that we need to exert in order to achieve those uh, joint accelerations, right? It's a really simple idea. We can actually, uh, to, 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 we can actually, uh, well, first, what, what could be a source of these uh, joint accelerations? Um, I mean, once you do the feed, feedback, feedback linearization, all that's left is uh, a trivial system, right? So, so really what you get is Q double dot 
equals q double dot des. So you can you can make these dynamics be whatever you want, really. So let's choose, for example, PD control. Let's let's say we have some uh, trajectory that we want to track. So we have q ref of t. Um, and then also its derivatives, q ref dot and q ref double dot. Um, let's say that q double dot desired is just q double dot ref. Oops, ref ft plus some gain times q ref minus q plus some other gain times q dot ref minus q dot. So this, this could be one way to come up with uh, joint accelerations that actually do something that you want, so track some trajectory. Um, we, can, we can actually make things a little bit fancier. Um, so here we're really just plugging uh, q double dot desired into the uh, the, the um, equations of motion, but we can we can also do uh, optimization, really a really simple optimization. But uh, still, this is sort of this leads to uh, other ideas that we can apply to, to apply to the humanoid robots. So the idea would be. Maybe we don't uh, specify all of the joint accelerations that we want directly. Maybe we leave it a little bit un under constraint. Uh, so what, what can we do? Well, maybe we can, for example, minimize uh, the norm of the torque vector. This is just one, one example. Uh, subject to uh, h q double dots. Plus C of Q V equals tau. Um, and in addition, let's say that we have some linear constraints on the joint acceleration vector. So let's say that we have D Q double dot equals E. Uh, and then our decision variables here are going to be tau and Q double dot. Now, of course, this, this sort of generalizes that idea, because we could just have the identity matrix here, and then on the right-hand side have our q double dot desired. Uh, but this sort of leaves room for more, uh, for other options as well. Uh, namely, one would be uh, to do um, tracking of a, a point, for example. So suppose we don't have um, a reference trajectory in joint space, like here. But instead, we have uh, some points that we want to track. So P ref of T. Let's say this is this point that, that we care about. That's P. Then, well, we know that P is some function of the, uh, of the joint angles, right? So we have P equals uh, F of Q doesn't really matter what f looks like right now. Uh, p dot, let's take the derivative, is just df dq times q dot. And since we were sort of working with accelerations here, let's take the derivative again. P, so let, let's call this, uh, this matrix j, so this is a Jacobian. So it's j q dot. Uh, so p double dot is uh, j q double dot plus j dot times q dot, right? So the fun thing is that this is actually in the same kind of form uh, that is accepted here, right? So if we just uh, move uh, this, let's see. So we can basically describe our task as uh, j q double dot is uh, p double dot ref 
let's say, or a pre dot, p double dot desired, I should say, uh, minus j dot q dot. Yeah. So let's let's just put this j matrix as a couple of rows as of the of the d matrix over here. So this will be part of our d matrix, and this together will be part of our e vector. Right. So this is just one one type of task in addition to these joints. Um, uh, joint reference tasks uh, that you can uh, add to this type of optimization. So maybe there's another point that you care about. So you add another couple of rows to your uh, D matrix and your E vector. So you can sort of achieve uh, multiple tasks as long as they don't um, uh, conflict with each other. And then you basically just solve this quadratic program because that's what it is. And you get out your torque vector. And also, uh, as a byproduct, the, the accelerations that you expect will be, uh, uh, will actually happen on the real robot. Okay, so this is kind of powerful. We can, we can describe all kinds of tasks. So you can already see if we were to apply this type of thing to uh, a humanoid robot, that um, we can describe tasks like, I want my, my foot to move from A to B, uh, according to some trajectory that we've made using maybe a spline. Uh, or I want to, to keep the orientation of my pelvis in a certain direction or in a, in a certain, uh, to, to follow a certain uh, reference trajectory, I should say. Uh, but also we can take, uh, already at this point, we can track a certain center of mass tasks. Uh, sorry, you have, you have a question. I'll optimize it the torque at any given point. At any given time? Uh, no, so. Or integral of torque over. So the, the yeah, that's a really good question. Um, this is all instantaneously. So we're going to consider Q and V to be fixed at this. We're just going to consider this point in time. So we're doing it trivially. Where do I? We're do, we're picking it trivially. We're, we're picking. What's best best torque right now? But exactly. It's not necessarily optimal in the long run. No, no. Uh, so yeah, what is optimal, I guess, depends on what goes into um, this optimization problem. So the the D and E. Uh, type uh, data. Um, with, that's a huge problem with this kind of approach is that there's no notion of, of the future at all. It's just a way to, to generalize or to, to take a bunch of tasks that you want to execute and actually execute them on the robot. Yeah, but um, that, that's a really good point. Um, we're going to have to move away from this type of approach to get any kind of, uh, to, to start exploiting the natural dynamics, for example, and to, to make things energy efficient. Uh, but we'll leave that for later. Uh, so for now, we, we're not quite done yet because we have this uh, fully actuated robot. Uh, and we want to generalize this to uh, robots that, that can, that contact the ground and are also not uh, fully actuated at, at the base. Right, so what should I keep here? Okay. Okay, so suppose now we have our stick man. Whoa, that's really bad. Let's go this way. Uh, so there's some fixed ground here, which either of the feet may or may not be in contact with. Let's, let's say that uh, this foot is in contact with the ground, and this one isn't. Um, so I think you've, you've already seen a different form of the equations of motion here that takes contact into, into account, right? Uh, so instead of this, we get something that looks more like h of q, q double dot, plus c of q and v equals v times u. 
so now we have some some selection matrix basically, or, or some some uh, non full rank matrix that takes our inputs and transforms it into the torque space. Uh, plus this contact Jacobian JC transpose times lambda, where are these where lambda is just a vector of contact forces basically. Uh, Have you guys seen this? Yeah? Okay. Um, all right, well, let's just take the same kind of approach that we did for the fully actuated model. Let's formulate a quadratic program. But now we're going to include these lambda uh, variables as well. And, and so let me just draw, for example, so there's a, a force here at the, at the heel. Say that's lambda one here, lambda two, uh, and then let, let's keep it at that, just so that it's clear. Okay, so how do we need to modify our QP to to do to handle this case? Well, we can minimize, like I said, over this time tau q double dot and lambda, even though we don't really, uh, are, are not really able to control lambda, uh, we're gonna have it as a decision variable. Uh, let's say we still minimize the torques. Uh, subject to these equations now, h q double dot, subject to the c of q and v, c, just c, uh, equals v times u. I should have put u here, sorry. Plus jc transpose lambda. And we're just gonna have the same type of uh, tasks. So we're gonna say that uh, d times q double dot equals e. So that's gonna allow us to express the motions, yep. Okay, so uh, subscript and the magnitude? Uh, to norm. Okay. Really, yeah. Doesn't matter. You can leave it out as well. Um, uh, okay. But so, is, is that all that there's to it? There are certain constraints on the on the contact force. Sorry. Yeah, you can't go into the ground. Exactly. Yeah. You can't you can't pull on the ground, for example. So, a force like like this would not be a lot, right? So you've seen this, I think, last week also with uh, the uh, LCP stuff. Uh, contact forces need to be in friction cones. Typically, uh, we use a, a Coulomb model for, for contact forces. So suppose there's some plane here with a normal N, then uh, there's some cone, and, and in 3D it's gonna basically look like this big ice cream cone in which the forces need to live, right? So lambda can be in here, lambda, but not in here. Let's say this, this is lambda one, lambda one, so this is not allowed. Um, so we can actually incorporate that constraint into our optimization. So we can say that lambda i, is in friction cone i uh, for all i. Does anybody know what kind of constraint this is? Having to be in this sort of ice cream cone. What's that? Uh, yeah, it's, this is a sort of a special case of semi-definite constraint. It's called a, a second order cone uh, constraint. Um, and, and it makes the problem a little bit harder. And we were all about trying to solve this uh, problem online at fast rates, right? So we're gonna actually uh, cheat a little bit and do a conservative inner approximation of this uh, friction cone constraint. And I think you've already seen this also in the last uh, uh, lecture, but I'll just remind you that what you can do is uh, basically have these basis vectors 
So um, let me draw it in the same diagram. I'm going to delete the lambda here and the bad lambda. Let's suppose you just have a finite set of basis vectors. So there's one in this direction. Let's call that beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3. Uh, so now you have this sort of pyramid. So this is a, a polyhedron, really. It, it extends uh, till infinity still, but it's an inner approximation of uh, the friction cone of this uh, sort of slightly harder to express constraint. Uh, so what we can say now is that lambda i, or let's just say lambda 1, needs to be the sum over j, let's call it j, uh, beta j times rho j, where rho j greater than or equal to zero. So what we're doing is we're taking a non-negative linear combination of these basis vectors, and each, each of, so if you just scale one of the, the betas by some non-negative number, then you get a valid force, right? That's in the friction cone. If you then uh, take an average of these uh, valid forces, then you get another valid force. Right. So, but now w instead of having this this more difficult constraint, we just have a set of linear constraints. Uh, so instead of this, we're going to do um, lambda i equals sum over j uh, rho i j. So there's indexing here, but whatever. Beta i j. Uh, for all i, and uh, rho ij greater than or equal to zero for all i, comma, j. All right, so now we have a QP again. And this QP, although it's much bigger than, uh, well, so the, 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 the dimensions really depend on, on uh, the size of u, q double dot lambda, of course. Uh, so it depends on the, the number of contacts you make with the world and uh, the number of uh, uh, the, the, dimen the dimension of your uh, state vector. Uh, but this is, I mean, you get into, into the range of 100 variables, maybe. And you can actually solve this kind of problem online at maybe 500 to 1,000 hertz. Um, so this is actually exactly what we did during the DRC. Uh, we did this planning in terms of footsteps. Then we went to the LIPM to, um, to get a center of mass plan. That's just one of the tasks that goes into this kind of framework, in addition to uh, foot tracking tasks, for example, and, and posture tasks and whatever. Uh, we solve this QP at a high rate, we get the torques, and we track those. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the, the main idea. All right. Then Robin's going to yep. finish it up. Cool. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so you're saying that the Okay, cool. Okay, so uh, we've talked a lot about what we did at the DRC, right? We had this, this divide and conquer approach. We separated things out into footstep planning and then tried to track those footsteps using a very simple dynamic model and then mapped the, the results from that simple dynamic model up to the, the full kinematics of the robot and the full dynamics using this QP approach. And it worked okay. Uh, it worked particularly well when the robot was walking normally. So when all of these assumptions that we were making that, you know, reachability is a reasonable way to talk about footsteps, when the, ro the terrain is relatively flat, so this idea of the center of mass moving in a horizontal plane, uh, when all of those assumptions held, things worked really well. Uh, when those assumptions started to break down, uh, things didn't go as well. And so in particular, uh, we, we had a lot of failures of things like trying to get the robot to climb out of a car. So climbing out of a car isn't modeled well by simple footstep planning. Uh, it doesn't allow the robot's center of mass to move perfectly in a plane. Uh, 
greedy approaches, as you pointed out, tend not to work very well. It requires a little bit of thinking ahead. Uh, and in practice, the robot sort of spectacularly fell apart and broke uh, while trying to get out of the car during the DRC. So we, we sort of know that what we're doing is useful, but it's not complete. It doesn't really feel like a complete solution to this problem. And so in sort of the interest of fairness, I wanted to bring up a couple of like other things that we're thinking about and that other people are thinking about uh, for how to maybe solve this problem in a different way. And so the first one is actually work that, uh, that we did um, during the DRC, which is uh, can we do something more reactive? So maybe a little bit more like what Boston Dynamics does. So can we, can we build a controller that allows the robot to uh, take some sort of unknown disturbance and react by taking a step and not falling over? And so the big difference there is that instead of doing some complicated footstep, and the answer is sometimes, uh, but not always. <laughs> um, so rather than doing a complicated footstep planning problem, we're going to do something much greedier, which is the same sort of linear inverted pendulum model, but only thinking sort of one step into the future with a very, very simple idea of basically just push the foot out in the direction that you're falling. And use these some of the same tools, so the same linear inverted pendulum model, the same QP controller, but with a, a much simpler sort of underlying idea of just keep stepping in the direction that you're falling. Uh, and actually, that, that's not a crazy idea. Uh, if you sort of do it right, and you just push the robot a little bit until it keeps stepping in the direction you're falling, it'll sort of keep stepping in the direction it's falling, and it'll walk. Um, <laughs> this worked OK. So we actually deployed this uh, at the DRC finals, and it did save the robot one time, definitely. Um, and it didn't save the robot at least one or two other times. Uh, but I mean, it, yeah, it, it, was, it was certainly helpful. Um, but actually applying this really exposed a lot of issues. Uh, in particular, one thing that we haven't talked at all about is how do you know where the robot is? So there's no way in general to measure position of the robot in some sort of absolute frame unless you have a, maybe a camera system that's watching the robot externally. Uh, so thing, we can measure the accelerations of the robot. We can measure its angular velocity with a gyroscope. But we don't know where it is. So we have to estimate that. Uh, and the way we do that is, is we generally make some sort of reasonable assumption, like at least one part of the robot is attached to the ground. So if you know that, for example, the left foot of the robot is fixed to the ground, then no matter what the robot does, you know where it is, because the left foot isn't moving. And then as soon as the right foot comes down, you can say, OK, well, now I know the right foot is attached. Uh, as soon as things start going badly, those assumptions are no longer true. Now you have no idea where the robot is. So all of your assumptions are wrong, and your model's wrong, and the robot falls apart. So what if we maybe didn't, maybe didn't do this? What if we didn't think about this particular choice of like divide, ways of dividing up the problem? Um, so way, way back at the beginning, we talked about like how, how would you go about solving this problem? And one of the, the ideas is, well, couldn't you just do trajectory optimization? Uh, and I said no. And I'm wondering if I might be wrong about that. So there's actually some cool work recently on doing very fast, very local trajectory optimization. So the, the problems still remain sort of fundamentally hard. We can't get globally optimal solutions at you know, in one millisecond for a complicated robot. But maybe we can get something that's locally optimal and sort of good enough. And so that, that's actually, uh, this is a video of this is not a humanoid, I'm sorry. I, I know I violated the title of the lecture, but I think quadrupeds are hopefully close enough. Uh, so this is a robot that's being controlled actually by doing uh, whole body model predictive control. So by which I mean solving lots and lots of trajectory optimizations. Uh, and they have a bunch of computational tricks to make that somewhat tractable. Uh, they're not, I mean, it's not magic. Like, they're still susceptible to the fact that these are nonlinear optimizations. They can get stuck in local minima. They don't always work. But it's a really attractive idea to not have to do all of this like really heavy decomposition of the problem and just write down the thing you actually want to solve, which is lots and lots and lots of trajectory optimizations. Um, but so far, this hasn't really deployed, been deployed on humanoid robots doing the kind of tasks that we saw at the DRC, uh, at least not yet. Uh, and then, of course, the other like radically other, different way of thinking about it is why don't we just throw a lot of GPUs at the problem? Uh, and that, I mean, it's kind of working. This actually, this just came out recently. Um, so th these results are cool. Uh, I, I think it's worth taking them with a grain of salt. Uh, all of these results are based, in this paper in particular, are based on having a reference motion. So, I mean, everything is easier if you tell the robot ahead of time exactly what you want it to do. Uh, the whole point of what we're trying to do here is that we, we don't want to specify exactly the motions that are going to go through. Um, but I do think there's a lot of uh, hope for general reinforcement learning. There's Atlas doing split 
flip kicks. Um, so, which is awesome. I mean, it's super cool. And like, they've, they've got some sort of notion of like uh, planning and, and thinking about the sense data. So far, we don't see this on real robots yet. I think at some point we will, but it's reinforcement learning techniques like this have been around for a while. They're still not on robots. They're still not actually making Atlas do spin flips. Yeah. Okay, okay. so maybe not like human robots like Atlas. Yeah. yeah. Definitely on, like definitely on manipulator imitation. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yes. No, uh, that's absolutely true. And so I think it's a super interesting question of yeah, wh why are they working pretty well on things like the Google Arm Farm and not yet? on Atlas? Uh, we don't know. Um, I think that there are interesting questions about like how accurate are the simulations that they're using? Um, what are the unmodeled parts of the system? In, in actually applying these techniques to the robot, there's a lot of theory and then there's uh, at least as much grad student tuning and like manual gradient descent of non-convex optimizations. So I mean we can, you know, the, that like swiggly outline of the reachable set was something that like I tuned basically by hand over the course of of months, right? And like the particular choices of Ks that we use for these PD laws are things that like Tuan and I would sit and like tune. Um, and like subtle things like the choice of that Z naught value. It turns out that that Z naught, you can't actually use the real height of the robot. You have to use something slightly different than the real height of the robot. Otherwise it falls over. And like these are reflective of the fact that the models we're using aren't really what the robot is. Like there are differences between what's going on in simulation and in theory and in hardware. And so I think that's part of why it's hard to transform these things. Uh, but I, I'm not ready to give up on writing down like the real problem that we want to solve, either in terms of trajectory optimization or learning and just solving that and then just put it on the robot and have it walk around. But so far we can't do that yet. Uh, so we have like one minute. Do you guys have any questions about either of the topics? Yeah. So um, you said that part of the problem with trajectory optimization is the high dimension of so is there a scope for using something like partial recognition to artificially reduce that dimensionality? Yeah, I mean, in some sense, that's exactly what we're doing here. Like, we're, we're reducing the dimensionality by thinking about only the dynamics of this simple center of mass model. And then we're going to, I mean, we're, we call it inverse dynamics, but it's essentially the same as partial feedback and linearization to sort of say, okay, I know I want the center of mass model to move this way, so I need to make the entire complicated robot perform some set of actions to, to mimic that. So, yeah, it's a good idea. Anything else? Cool. Okay, well, thanks guys. Uh, we'll see you back next week, or they'll see you, I won't. I'll see you on YouTube, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>